Pew Bible, page 38. Now the reading of God's holy inspired and God's word. Now there was a famine in the land, besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt, live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky, and will give them all these lands, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, and my laws. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister, because he was afraid to say, She is my wife. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah, because she is beautiful. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, She is really your wife. Why did you say, She is my sister? Isaac answered him, Because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. Then Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the men might have slept with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, Anyone who molests this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac planted crops in that land, and the same year reaped a hundredfold, because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug, and the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Move away from us, you have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died, and he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, and the water is ours, um, and said, The water is ours. So he named the well Esset, because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they poured over that one also, so he named it Sitnam. He moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboam, saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his personal advisor, and Pichol, the commander of his forces. Isaac asked him, Why have you come to me, since you are hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, We saw freely that the Lord was with you. So we said, There ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we did not molest you, but always treated you well, and sent you away in peace. And now you are blessed by the Lord. Isaac then made a feast for them, and they ate and drank. Early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other, and Isaac sent them on their way, and they left them in peace. That day, Isaac's servants came and told them about the well they had dug. They said, We found water. He called it Sheba. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beri the Hittite, and also Basima, daughter of Elon the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. As far as the reading of God's holy word, may He bless the hands, hearts, and minds of His people. I'm sure many of you have heard the axiom "like father, like son." Encapsulated in that uh, in that axiom is the uh, is the belief and the conviction that the actions that we take, the things that we do, uh, the behavior that we model as parents, um, can often be something that, that carries on from generation to generation. And that brings me to this uh, often debated topic about so-called generational curses. Now, this concept of generational curses um, really stems from the second commandment in Exodus chapter 20, where we just read 
these words about uh, not bowing down to an idol. And the reasoning, the grounding that the Lord gives for not doing this, not worshiping idols, is, uh, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Um, and so many people have said, well, this, this is God saying here, um, you know, if I sin, does, does that mean that my sons and then my son's children and then my son's children's children are going to experience uh, the consequences uh, of that sin? They're going to be uh, punished because of my sin. Uh, well, it doesn't really make sense when you look at other passages like Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, where there we read, the one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteous of the right, the righteousness of the righteous will be pregnant in them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. So what, what can we say about this chapter, Genesis 26, where the axiom, like father, like son, almost seems to be playing out in perfect high definition. I mean, does this not sound familiar to you, this chapter, this story, how this telling of events in Isaac's life? Um, it seems that he's following the pattern um, on, on the, on the, not, the footsteps that he should not be following in are the footsteps that Isaac is, is, is following in, is following the footsteps, Abraham's footsteps. You know, well, um, what I do believe is being communicated here is that um, our choices and our decisions, our attitudes and our behaviors um, can be modeled and can be uh, sent down to our parents, uh, but, or sent down from our parents, uh, but that does not mean that uh, we are um, lost causes. In fact, Exodus chapter 20 is really communicating what it means to be rather one who is in uh, covenant with God or one who is not. For instance, remember what it says. It says, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third or fourth generation of those who hate me. Well, one thing we can say about uh, Abraham, all, although his life is imperfect, although his expression of faith is is lackluster at times. He is in covenant with God, and he is one that loves God. And therefore, it's amazing to see that God, those who love him, he shows love to a thousand generations. A thousand generations. So you really can't say by this statement, Is God's natural way to show love in his so-called strange way uh, to punish. Because he only punishes the third or fourth generation, but he shows love to a thousand generations. Well, how can we say that God is continuing to show love to Isaac, regardless of Isaac following the footsteps of his father in ways that uh, express a lack of faith? Well, we can say this, um, and we can share even though we are fallen in our parents, even though we're sinners just like our parents, right? God's grace abounds to us in Jesus Christ. Uh, so we're going to look at a number of ways that Isaac is a sinner just like his father, okay? The first is off to Egypt. In the beginning of chapter 26, the biblical author even wants us to grab onto this connection. He says, there was a famine in the land, and then makes this qualifier. This was a different famine than the famine that was during Abraham's time, okay? But what's being said here is that just like Abraham experienced a hardship when he was in the promised land, there was a drought, there was a famine, and Abraham was tempted by that drought and that famine to leave the place of promise and to go to somewhere else where he could find what he would need um, Isaac does the same thing. And we read that Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar, but we really read that Isaac's intention was just like his father's, and that is to go to Egypt. In verse 2, we read that the Lord appeared to Isaac, and he 
said, do not go down to Egypt. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Why would the Lord say, do not go down to Egypt, unless he knew that it was Isaac's intention to go down to Egypt? You see, just like Isaac's father Abraham, Isaac said, this is a time of difficulty and hardship. I am going to go down to Egypt. Because I know in Egypt they're more well equipped to handle famines like this. And this is a story that plays out in the book of Genesis over and over again. It's a story that plays out in the book of Exodus over and over again. And what we find is that what comes to be understood about going down to Egypt is that that is a representation of leaving the place of promise for the things that are in this world. Seeking solace in this world, seeking sustenance in this world. And I say, just like his sinner dad, Abraham, during a time of hardship and famine in the promised land, thinks that maybe he'll find what he needs in Egypt. But unlike Abraham, in this situation, in this instance, the Lord intervenes. The Lord comes to Isaac and says, don't go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I'll be with you and bless you. And instead, what God does is he comes to Isaac, and he reiterates the promise that he gave to his father Abraham. And he says in very many uh, similar ways, the covenant ground, the grounds of the covenant that God has made with Abraham. He says, to your descendants, I'll give these lands to confirm the oath I swear to your father Abraham. I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky, and give them all these lands, and through your seed, all nations on earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me, kept my commandments, um, and the decrees and laws. So Isaac, he stayed there and brought. Um, he stayed there because the Lord came to him and gave a promise that the Lord would bless him. And just like he had promised Abraham, okay? Um, so the, that, that is a, a temptation that we have as well. When things get hard, living the life of faith, sometimes we have the temptation to find our solace, to find our peace, to find our wholeness, to find what is lacking in the world, rather than in Christ. Brothers and sisters, I promise you, there's nothing in this world that can satisfy. When we do that, we are only drinking from broken cisterns. When we do that, we are uh, chasing after emptiness, after wind, after bed. <clears throat> My encouragement to you is to uh, keep your feet firmly planted in the place of promise. That is where God respond to this great blessing that he's been given, this, uh, this visitation from God, that God appeared to Isaac, the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant of God, appeared to Isaac, and he said, I'm going to bless you. I, just, I made the same promise to your father Abraham, I'm making the same promise to you, I am going to bless you. Well, we find out how Isaac responds. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, wow, she is my sister because he was afraid to say, she is my wife. He thought, the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebecca, because she is beautiful. Because she is beautiful. So, uh, not only during Abraham's life did he do this once when he went down to Egypt, but then also another time when he was with, uh, most likely, this is Abimelech's uh, father or grandfather. Um, so I made this point She's my sister again, again. Because one of our conversations 
on Abraham was, wow, he said she's my sister again. Well, like father, like son. And interestingly enough, uh, Rebecca is kind of related to him, right? Um, but yeah, he, he's, he's worried for his life. And so, he says, um, she's my sister. Because I don't, I don't want to be killed. Um, he has a really an interesting way of com uh, complimenting his wife. Because she's so beautiful, I'm going to call her my sister. He's like, I don't want to get killed. You know, now, when we talk about this, we talk about how this is so contrary to the heart of the husband. The heart of the husband is, is one to protect and not to think about oneself, not to think about preservation of one's own life, but to think about sacrificing your life for the sake of those you love, for the sake of the one that you have committed to, right? This is, this is contrary to what a husband is supposed to do. He's thinking about himself. He's not thinking about his wife. But on top of that very surface level of reality, that Isaac is not embodying Christ in the, in the marriage in this moment, giving himself up for Rebecca, his wife, but rather he's, he's sacrificing her. Her honor, her dignity. Right? Also, we could say that Isaac obviously is not believing the promise that God has given him. Now, when God, the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant God, appears to you and says, uh, I will bless you, I will be with you, and I will bless you, and he says to you, you and your descendants, I'll give all these lands, confirm the oath, I swear to your father, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I'll give them all these lands through your sea and all nations on earth will be blessed. You kind of have to be alive to, for that to happen, right? You kind of have to be living for that to happen. And so, Isaac goes from this mountaintop moment of an appearance of the covenant God, the Lord, Yahweh, coming to him and giving blessing upon blessing upon blessing to then turning around and saying, well, yeah, she's my sister. And you know, as much as it's easy to go, wow, Isaac, you are the absolute worst. I mean, I can't even. How could you even possibly, you know, have this great moment of, of the Lord appearing before you and, and promising you these great and wonderful promises, but then turn around and, and just sitting like that, disrespecting your life and, and thinking about your own preservation and protection and just not believing that the Lord is going to be with you until we realize how much we rely on this man. How much we rely on this man. You know, sometimes I feel like I have a, uh, a self-destruct button. Have you ever felt like that? Like everything is going well in your life. The Lord is blessing you. Um, you've got all these things going for you, yet at the same time, you want to sabotage it. There's a part of you that wants to think, I don't deserve this, and I'm going to hit this button, be, you know, blow it all up by pursuing this path of sinfulness or, or wickedness or whatever it may be. You know, sometimes you can just be oblivious to all the ways that the Lord is blessing you and the Lord is, is with you and the Lord is caring for you and the Lord is, 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 is watching over you. And sometimes you can be oblivious to all the promises of God that are written down here in this word for you to take in and to believe and to trust in. Sometimes you can be oblivious to all this and you can be afraid of your life. You can walk in doubt and worry and concern. Unless we think that this is something that's just only exhibited by Isaac in the Bible, think about Peter. Think about the moment that Peter has when Jesus says, well, Who do you say I am? And 
Peter makes that great confession. Those were the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, on this rock I will build my church. And then Jesus says, you know, the Son of Man, he has to go and he has to die on the cross. And then three days later, he'll, he'll be raised again. And, and Simon says, we're going to get talked to you. Hey, let's not do that, okay? Because that's not what I think the Savior should be, the Messiah is supposed to be. And I know that that's not going to bring me any glory, because I want to be uh, at the right hand, your right hand man, when you come into the glory of your kingdom. And that's not going to happen by you dying, okay? So let's just stop that talk. And what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Wow, that's a good question. How quickly the tables can turn. It happens in Isaac's life. It happens in Peter's life. It happens in my life. These great mountaintop moments can be Hour of the shadow of death. And you know what? I can take the glory of my shadow. You don't see him beyond the sky. I can take the I can cast all my anxieties on him because he cares for me. I forget that Jesus said, My peace I give to you, not as the world. So he calls Isaac and he says, She's your wife. And he says, Why did you say she's my sister? And Isaac says, started Isaac on a journey away from Gerar, sort of this midway point between Egypt and the promised land, this sort of on the fence place of faith back towards the land of promise, back towards the place of blessing. Verse 12 through 25, this, could, this, this whole passage, this whole section could be called, called Oh Well, because it's, it's, it's all about wells. And many, many of us don't understand the importance of wells, but um, in those times, in those days, it was so important to have water, to have an ability to give water. Well, what is happening is we, uh, we see Isaac be blessed by God in this land, there are. And has become so blessed by God that all the people who are there, the Philistines who are there, um, they're becoming envious of him. And because of this envy, they're uh, attacking him in sort of very, uh, um, how would you say, passive aggressive ways by filling in these um, wells uh, that he was using, that Abraham had dug in his day. And so what we see here is that finally, then like sends him away. You're too powerful for us. You're too great for us. You need to move away from us. And so Isaac's servants dug in the valley. This 
discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerard quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, the water is ours. So he named the well Essek. And Essek means dispute. Um, then they dug another well. But they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sidnon. Sidnon means opposition. And he moved on from there and dug another well. And no one quarreled over it. So he named it Rehoboth. Um, Rehoboth means room. And so he said, now the Lord has given us room and we'll flourish in the land. And so what is interesting about this is that um, Isaac keeps encountering this conflict, this opposition. Isaac, in his blessing, is now receiving um, what, uh, what we call attention from the world, attention, because they're saying he's grown powerful, he's grown blessed by the Lord, and because of this, Isaac is experiencing this conflict. And this conflict, interestingly enough, is leading Isaac home to the promised land. That he has to move further and further away from Abimelech and the Philistines, further and further away from Gerard, because these, uh, this conflict is happening in his life. And, and eventually, this conflict, this hardship, leads him home. And we read, from Rehoboth, he went up to Beersheba. And Beersheba was a place that his father Abraham lived for a long time in the promised land. It's a place where the father, his father Abraham was blessed by God and, and grew and, and, and uh, set, set roof down in very many ways uh, while he was uh, wandering in the promised land. And so what you can say here is that God is using hardship in Isaac's life to lead him home. God is using hardship to move him from one well to another until he's finally back in the place of blessing, the promised land. Firmly grounded in the place that exemplifies his faith in the promises of God. You see, many of us, many of us don't understand, and some of us may even think that when hardship is going on in our lives, this is an example that God is against us, that God is not blessing us, that God is not for us. Or maybe some of us know. Maybe some of us have experienced ourselves that God is using pain, sickness, Family infighting and struggles, relationship difficulties, grief, loss, and hardship to bring us closer to Him. Many of us may know of people who were walking away from the Lord, who were not walking with the Lord, who were going off to Egypt. And giving everything they can for the world and what the world and its pleasures and desires and, and all of its fancy, shiny things had to offer. But then hardship and difficulty struck them. They had a great loss. They entered the season of suffering. And that season of suffering did not create in them a bitterness towards God, but it's softened their hearts towards God. And now they look back on that hardship that happened in their life with gratitude and thankfulness. Because it's that hardship that the Lord used to lead them home to Him. And that's exactly what's happening in Isaac's life right now. Maybe they didn't understand why he had to keep fighting for this water, fighting for this well. But eventually he realized, hey, I'm back in the land that the Lord has promised to me. Back in the place of blessing. Back in the place of faith. How has God used hardship in your life to lead you to Him? How has He used difficulty, pain, suffering, sickness, loss in your life? You see, uh, even though we are sinners like our parents, God's grace abounds. And uh, one way 
that uh, we can see that finally in this passage is that at the end of Isaac's life, he had some staying power. Um, if his excursion away from the promised land lasted 40 years, uh, we're told he lived 180 years, then he stayed in the promised land faithfully for 80 years of his life. He ended his life faithfully in the place of God's blessing. And maybe and many of these experiences that he went through, walking in the footsteps of his father, testing out what it means to be someone who lives in the world and lives in sin and lives outside of faith, um, um, taught him the importance of standing on the promises of God. Uh, but but uh, one last thing that we can say about uh, knowing and trusting uh, that God's grace abounds to us in Jesus Christ is that when we look at what the rest of uh, the Bible says about Isaac, uh, the Bible does not bring up and mention Isaac's shortcomings, Isaac's uh, less than glamorous moments of going off to Egypt, trying to go off to Egypt, uh, lying about his wife being his sister. In fact, uh, we might look at Isaac's life and think it's quite insignificant in comparison to the chapters uh, devoted to Abraham and the chapters devoted to his son Jacob in the book of Genesis. Um, but Interestingly enough, God chooses to call himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And in the great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, we get a few things about Isaac. We get a few things told to us about, about him and his faith and his journey. And it's, uh, it's not negative things. They're beautiful things. They're things that uh, exemplify what it means uh, to us. Uh, put forward him as an example to us who are walking in this faith journey. In Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 or 16 said of Isaac that he was looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. Uh, I, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 20 says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. This is uh, the man of faith, Isaac. You see, what we see about Isaac is God does not hold Isaac's sin against him. If we were to say, which category is Isaac in, in relation to the second famine, it would be, but showing love to the thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments, regardless of Isaac's weaknesses, regardless of his sin. He forgets the sins, God does. He forgets the sins and he remembers the victories. We thank you that even though in many ways we follow after the pattern of our parents and sin, that uh, you forgive our sins in Jesus Christ. Even though, Lord, in many ways, like Father, like Son, we also believe like Father God, like Son of God. And Lord, you will, in Christ, forgive us of all our sins. Give us the gift of perfect righteousness, and we may walk with you all the days of our
your life and you may forget all of our losses and remember all our victories for your sake and for your glory and for our good. And that we know that your grace abounds to us in Jesus Christ. Enough to cover up the generational sins. Enough to cover up those things that we still struggle with. Enough to cover up even the way we walk in the footsteps of our parents before us. Continue to help us to live, Lord, in godliness and holiness. Continue to make us look more like your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Will you sing with me, Psalm Hymn 410? Psalm Hymn 410, come to the Savior now and we'll be happy.